There's a chance to see the first ever television interview with Michael Jackson and his wife Lisa Marie Presley. That's on Friday evening at 7 o'clock on BBC One. So, what's the connection between Phyllis Nelson, Tasman Archer and Yaz? Do you know this wicked jungle is Diva? Do you know where you can find out and when? 11.15. BBC what? BBC Two. Yes, on the vibe. Friday, 11.15. Goodbye. Check it. In a change to the scheduled programme, at 11.15 tonight, author Maya Angelou comes face to face with Jeremy Isaacs. This is BBC Two, now Newsnight. What's the lady up to? Margaret Thatcher accuses John Major. On homeowners, on Europe, on tax. You've sold out the voters. They are saying to us, let's get the message. You've not been conservative enough. Good evening. It was an extraordinarily blunt and fiery critique of her successor's record at number 10. Even if she does have a book to sell, and even if it's no surprise to hear her speaking passionately, even for her, this was blistering stuff. And it's left Mr Major and his cabinet more or less dumb tonight. So, we ask, what is her agenda? Is Lady Thatcher out, in spite of her own strong denial, to destroy Mr Major? Or is she out to try and drag him back to what she sees as real conservatism? I'll be talking to two Tory MPs, one of whom applauds her, and the other one who does not. Also tonight, what did go wrong in Bradford, and could it happen elsewhere? Asians in East London's Tower Hamlet say they too would fight if challenged by the police. So does West Yorkshire's police chief plead guilty to heavy-handedness? Or do Asians themselves recognise the fault is within their own community? And from Northern Ireland, Miriam O'Callaghan assesses the importance of this week's by-election in the seat of the late Sir James Kilfeather. Here in North Down, Thursday's by-election is being seen as a critical litmus test of current unionist thinking. But just how important is this election and what effect might it have on the future direction of unionism? Well, Mr Major and his uh, colleagues are keeping their counsel tonight about just what political impact Lady Thatcher intended with this evening's BBC television interview. It was the most sweeping criticism she's made yet of what's happened to Conservative policy since she left office. Pretty rich, you might think, from someone who was quoted today as saying that she'd left the House of Commons so that there'd be no suggestion she was looking over anyone's shoulder. Well, tonight she called Mr Major an overpowering headmaster for removing the whip from the MPs who rebelled on Europe. She deplored the reduction in mortgage relief, and she said what she'd achieved in government had been undermined. So, is it just that she wants to sell as many copies of the second volume of her memoirs as she can, or does it go a lot deeper than that? Mark Mardell investigates. You've done it all. When Lady Thatcher goes into print, there are queues at the bookshops and nervous flutters in high places. What she writes makes news. But two years ago, the headlines made her sound bitter, snarling at those who'd betrayed her. This time, the book launch has been the excuse for a more measured attack, almost her alternative manifesto for conservative success. In a series of key interviews, she's repeated the same points using the same phrases. She summed up the mood of the voters quite simply. They are saying to us, let's get the message. You've not been conservative enough. Those who exited clutching the signature of their heroine agree with her analysis. John Major appears to be so weak, so woolly, so negative. What would you like to see him do? I'd like to see him go. They're no longer uh, trying to satisfy us. They're trying to satisfy the city and the big wigs in the city all the time and not uh, listening to what the people want and need. Lady Thatcher's criticisms undoubtedly strike a chord, and they're more detailed and more forthright than any she's made in the past. 
And most important of all, they come at a critical juncture for the Prime Minister. Tomorrow he'll face a senior delegation of MPs, including Norman Lamont, who'll make similar complaints. And also the Cabinet are at this moment engaged in a crucial battle to decide what the future manifesto will contain. Giving in to the right in Cabinet would ease the pressure on Mr Major, and pressure there is. In recent days, there's been a big surge in the number of MPs privately saying that there should be a leadership challenge. Listening to Lady Thatcher might appease them, but how practical is it? If Mr Major wants to make Maggie and the right smile, he could adopt one simple policy, rule out a single European currency this century. I would say no single currency. This demeans Britain. John Major's rhetoric has steadily become more Eurosceptic, and some on the right think his statement in the Commons last week was a big move, a curtain raiser to a manifesto commitment. I don't uh, myself believe that the question of joining a single currency will in practice arise for some time. Arguably, the circumstances may not ever be right, Madam Speaker. But such policies are not free from danger. Lady Thatcher herself believes it was her views on Europe that brought her down. An alliance of party grandees, of the left in Cabinet and big business could revolt if Mr Major categorically ruled out a single currency in the next parliament. Even one of those entrusted by Lady Thatcher with guarding her heritage, the chairman of the Thatcherite Conservative Way Forward group, recognises that the Prime Minister has to haver on a single currency. If that will keep the party together, whereas a bold statement might split it, then I don't think I'd be surrendering anything because I passionately believe the circumstances are never going to arise. So I could live uh, with the position as the Prime Minister has it now. The other big move Mr Major could make to please his old boss would be by taking economic steps to help homeowners. Lady Thatcher spreading the word on the Today programme this morning sees home ownership as the cornerstone of her philosophy and believes this government has piled tax on the very people who kept her in power. Alas, three times the mortgage relief has been cut on the people who trusted us when we said we want capital earning democracy, we want home ownership. And they went in believing they'd still have that mortgage relief. But reversing that would be expensive for Mr Major. Reinstating mortgage tax relief would cost £2 billion, Restoring married couples allowance would cost 2.2 billion and cutting insurance tax would be another 700 million, a total of 4.9 billion pounds. The Prime Minister's office today pointedly said that keeping inflation and interest rates down was what homeowners wanted. But Mr Major has in fact told his policy unit to look at more concrete tax incentives and that worries economists. It would be a serious retrograde step to uh, try to resuscitate the housing market via various subsidies and help for home buyers. The rampant inflation in the housing market over the years, in my view, has been a serious drag on the British economy. It's distorted people's conceptions of where wealth comes from and it's misallocated resources. It should be left to flounder. Lady Thatcher is never likely to find John Major an inspirational leader and that in itself may make her smile. The next test of the depth of the government's unpopularity will be in the Littleborough and Saddleworth by-election, where Tony Blair was on parade today. Lady Thatcher says she likes his style. While senior Tories publicly wrangle over the party's soul, ordinary party workers look on in dismay. When we had the previous elections, when she was standing again, um, she did seem to be able to uh, uh, get, get people to rally, rally round, you know, and... Uh, um, to be uh, influenced by, by the way she spoke and, and uh, by the thoughts she had and, and the policies. Margaret Thatcher has articulated many of the, the fears, not just worries, fears of grassroots conservatives, even disaffected conservatives, I dare say. It. She was saying to John Major, when we uh, elected you, we uh, did so because we believed you had strong, true political instincts. We still believe you have. Give vent to them. Uh, put your doubts on, on one side. Be a centre-right conservative. Lady Thatcher's attack has damaged an already weak administration. While she acknowledges that John Major is rediscovering the true path, the criticisms only underline the contention that he was apt to wander off in the first place.
While I discuss some of those ideas that uh, Mark Mardell was talking about, I'm joined by Ian Duncan Smith, Conservative MP, who, member of the Fresh Start Group. They'll be addressed by Mr Major uh, tomorrow. Uh, and George Walden, Conservative MP and former Education Minister. George Walden, do you welcome Lady Thatcher's interview? No, not at all. I don't think it's an agenda. I, I think it's an outburst. And I think it, it, it'll do her much more damage than it will John Major. I think her remarks are um, simplistic, chauvinistic, uh, and rather sad. Isn't she speaking for a great number of voters? No, I don't think she is. Um, and if, if she is, uh, I, I think that makes it worse in the sense that she is appealing in those remarks about Europe and home ownership to what I can only call the sort of lowest form of populism. And there is a link between her remarks on Europe and home ownership. Because in each case, she is appealing, in my view, to illusions. Uh, the illusion that there is an enemy at the gate, that there's a sort of phony war that we must engage in with Europe, perhaps to replace the Cold War in her imagination. And secondly, the illusion that your house is really worth much more than it is, and the state must help you boost the prices. Now, this may go down well with a certain you know, person uh, out there, but it seems to me irresponsible of anyone in government to take those attitudes, and in government, Margaret Thatcher would never have said either of those things. Ian Duncan Smith, do you agree? Well, I think George has been rather simplistic about it. I mean, it's not something, when, when she spoke today, it's not something that everybody should say, right, that's it, there's the agenda. That's not at all the case. I think really what one should do is stand back and look at it and say, here is somebody who has been the leader of a party for a particular period and prime minister of a number of re-elections. And she's saying there are some concerns out there. She's articulating those concerns. And so I think it's not a, a problem for us. I think it's something that we have to look at and say, well, is there some nub of truth in this? Is there really a problem? And if so, how do we address those concerns? And after all, it's not just about being there at the general election. It'll be about being re-elected. So, Really, it's too simplistic to say all is wrong with what she says. I think it's more a question of, is she articulating concerns? And I think there is an answer of yes. What do you think is going to be the effect of this on an already deeply divided Conservative Party and a Prime Minister who's in trouble with his own position? The effect will be much less than the media think. Uh, I think that by contrast with some of Miss Lady Thatcher's remarks, uh, the government will be shown to be uh, responsible. I believe it's been very responsible in its realism about the housing market, which was grossly inflated, I'm sorry to say, by Lady Thatcher's government, and led to gross uh, disappointment, uh, which we all know about today. And that, I'm sorry to say, is largely her fault. And I don't think that people are chauvinistic towards Europe. There is a problem with the single currency. I personally have grave doubts about it, but I think the last thing you should do as a responsible politician is to whip up a sort of chauvinistic attitude towards something which may well never come to pass. What do you think, Ian Duncan Smith, is her essential intention here? When she says that she wants uh, you and George Walden to be real Conservatives again, what is she really trying to say? What is the message in policy to her? I don't think there's any particular hidden message. I think it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, you'll have to ask Lady Thatcher exactly, but I would surmise that what Lady Thatcher is saying is, look, the public out there who by and large are Conservative, by and large really do not wish to vote for Socialism, They've said... Which is well, what Mr Major's offering them? Well, no, they're saying the Labour Party is socialist. What they don't want to be is to be voting for them. They're not laid up against the idea of a Labour government. But what they do want to know is some of the certainties about what it is, actually, that they'll be voting for with us. Now, one of the key issues is most uh, importantly the single currency. George said quite rightly he has major concerns with it. But actually, we have to somehow give a lead to those others in Europe who would have doubts as well and say, look... This is not going to work, and we don't want to plunge off into the dark over it and destroy our economy. Therefore, we're going to say to you, no, we're not heading into this, and that's our manifesto pledge. I think that's very So you'd like, you'd like the effect of Mrs Thatcher's uh, interventions today to be to push Mr Major further and further in the direction of saying, I don't want a single currency. But I don't think he actually needs pushing. I think what he is now articulating is that that is very much his view of it. It's not likely to happen, and therefore we should rule it out. I agree very much with Ian that we should try to persuade Europe to go slow on this thing. I happen to believe that Europe is going to go slow anyway, if you look at Major's talks with Chirac, for example. Um, what I am very strongly against, and it's a side of the Conservative Party that worries me increasingly personally, is this rather defensive and rather insecure way that we are beginning to have of trying to boost ourselves by inventing external threats. I'm very strongly against that personally, and I think it will 
do damage to the Conservative Party because ultimately it won't wash with the public because our problems are 99% homegrown. Briefly, the effect of this on a possible leadership contest in the autumn, is it going to make it more or less likely? No, I, I think that as she said quite clearly at the beginning, leadership question is out. What we want well, to see... Well, she said that, but what about the effect on Mr Major? Well, I think as the Prime Minister will demonstrate that actually he doesn't believe one is going to happen. But I must say... What, Does he come out stronger as a result of what happened today? I think he will do in the end. I think there's no question. Well, look, I must just say thing. one thing is most important is that it isn't a case of saying we'll take any old policy. It's about saying what are Conservative policies against the single currency is the most particular clear issue about putting British economy first. That's simple. Is there going to be a leadership contest? I think we're dealing with a flash in the pan tonight, and I think that, by contrast, Mr Major will look more sensible and realistic. Thank you both very much. Well, now, after more than four hours of talk between police chiefs and Bradford's Asian community leaders, the West Yorkshire force tonight promised an internal inquiry into the events which led to this weekend's violent scenes on the streets of Manningham. Two police officers involved in the weekend's confrontation have been shifted to other duties. But as both sides pledged to build bridges, there was still resentment among Asians at police suggestions that a breakdown in family discipline was the primary cause of the trouble. So was what happened in Manningham an isolated incident, or does it signify a more widespread malaise in the Asian community? Krishnan Gurumurthy has been finding out. Ever since 300 young protesters took to the streets in the Manningham area of Bradford on Friday night, people have been arguing about why it happened. The locals say it started over an incident in which the police were abusive and heavy-handed in arresting two people on public order offences. I think they have to change their attitude. That is right. Yeah, Asians. that is right. I think they're, 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 they're probably st stereotyping Asians. I think they're all bad. These young people have grown up in the UK. They are British citizens. They were <laughs> born and bred, you know, born and bred in Yorkshire, basically. Right, okay. So these people don't think like the older people. As the depressing aftermath sunk in, the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire presented an alternative analysis. The trouble was caused, he said, by Asian youths rejecting their own traditional values and teachings. We've got a, a, a large number now of, of Asian youths who feel disenfranchised, as it were, that they don't wish to follow their father's teachings and religion and yet perhaps feel alienated from the Western society in which they're trying to integrate. So it's extremely difficult, but that doesn't excuse uh, such sort of disgraceful actions that we saw on our streets last night. He may not have realised this at the time, but if the Chief Constable was right about what he said, his words could have huge significance. If a generational divide could have started a riot in Bradford, then why not in Manchester or Birmingham or here in London's East End? But as quickly as he made his analysis, Asians across the country have been quick to dismiss them as the words of a man who simply doesn't understand. For Asian communities in Britain, family cohesion is perhaps the most important cultural definition. If it is breaking down, that would have serious consequences. But most refuse to accept it as a serious proposition. I can't believe that somebody in his positions could make such a gross um, you know, error of judgment in his uh, ass assessment. I think it's very, very important to state that, if anything, families um, of Asian origin, um, and particularly Muslim families, are stronger than ever. And the family structures have been one of support and uh, understanding. And I think in an area like this, in fact, it's um, I believe it's maintained the kind of calm and the quiet that we've, um, you know, um, we've had for quite some time. The Asian press is being even more vociferous. Eastern Eye's editorial this week will not only argue that the generation gap idea misses the point, but that it fuels the kind of racial problems that the Asian community is complaining about in the first place. I think the police and the media are missing the point by focusing on problems within the Asian community. What they should be looking at is problems within the police force and how they can stop um, these things, these riots occurring again. There's a big race relations problem in this country. Every young Asian has been either harassed by the police themselves or knows someone who has. And unless the police act harder and more quickly on these race relations problems, then I'm afraid riots like this could occur all over Great Britain. There's little doubt that today's young Asians are different to their parents, as much as any other group of young people in this country. 
Youth Connection started up in response to racial attacks in East London. These boys don't want to riot, but they do say they aren't prepared to take the same abuse that their parents put up with. Our elders were passive people that turned to turn the other chick and say, well, look, let's ignore it. Whereas younger Asian people growing in Britain saying, well, hold on, we've got just as much right as any other person in this country. We're here to live, work, and make our livelihoods in this country. So we're not going to turn the other chick, and I think it's wrong for young Asian people to turn the other chick. Do you feel you have a stake in this country? Of course I have a stake in this country. I've got, I've got a job that's well paid, and I'm, I'm working with a local department and everything else. I've got friends, I've got brothers and sisters that are born and brought up here. You know, we, our home is this country. We, we are systematically being left out of the decision-making process when it comes down to making decisions and making sure equal ops is on an agenda. I think that's where the black community at large is being left out, not just the Asian, but the black community at large is being left out. So yes, you know, to a certain extent, there is, you know, a sense of alienation. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Muslim leaders at the East London Mosque say the riots in Bradford are a case of society reaping what it sows. They say despite their best efforts in classes like this, they are sometimes losing the cultural battle. And they say the British establishment is conspiring against them. We, uh, our application is turned down on the ground that this is a religious organisation. For example, we run a mother tongue class for the last 20 years. All the little organizations, some of them are only paper organizations, they get funding, but not us. And uh, any other health education work, community work, counseling, whatever we provide, it's not funded by the uh, local councils or central government. Tonight's meeting in Bradford seems to have given the local community a little of what they want. But the question remains across the country, whether both sides will learn their lessons from this or continue to apportion blame. Christian Guru Murphy reporting. Well, I'm joined now by uh, Aki Nawaz, who is a uh, young Asian activist who was brought up in Bradford and was there over the weekend. Uh, Nerj Diva, Conservative MP for Brentford and Isleworth in uh, West London, uh, and uh, from Bradford by Chief Constable Keith Hallowell of West Yorkshire Police Force. Uh, Chief Constable, does the fact that you are shifting two of your officers um, to other duties mean that you recognise that you were too heavy-handed in Bradford? I think what it shows is a, a goodwill on our part that uh, recognising that those officers working in that area would be a continued sore to members of that community. So until the issues are resolved, yes, they, they're not going to work in that particular area. But could I just write one of the things that, that has been said when it was suggested that I was saying that the breakdown with the, the family within the community was to blame? What I did say, and this was words that were reflected and given to me over a period of two or three years by elders within the community that they had concerns that the young people both male and female had no wish to follow the, their ways were moving in western ways in ways in which away from arranged marriages and other things that they didn't like so so my words were not as my critics are saying something that i dreamt up I was reflecting and repeating what had been told to me by senior members but of the Asian community. If, if I could just get you quite clear, what you are saying is that essentially the problem in Bradford was caused not by anything the police did, but by problems within the Asian community. No, I haven't said that. No, no, please correct me then. Yes, with respect, Peter, you, you're jumping in. I was right. asked what were some of the reasons for it, and I said they were extremely complex, complex reasons. A lot of frustrations within the young community and certainly within the Asian community. Frustrations about education, frustrations about um, opportunities in the workplace, all sorts of frustrations which, which are born in okay. communities with high levels of unemployment. The, the, the parents and the leadership was just right. part of a report that I gave. Right, now Aki Nawaz, how do you react to what you've heard the Chief Constable saying uh, in explaining what happened in Bradford? Well, I think he's been talking about the frustrations of um, <coughs> the community, but he hasn't once mentioned the frustration at how the police deal with Asian youth or black youth in this country. And I think it doesn't just happen in Bradford, it happens everywhere in England. Uh, the police are totally heavy-handed. They have no respect whatsoever for people of colour. Um, they're above the law. They're not accountable. There's so many, so many cases what haven't been resolved uh, by, you know, by um, heavy-handedness of the police. And, um, you know, this will just be another case 
where there'll be an inquiry and uh, nothing will be done about the police. The real issue here is the police and the way it goes about its business. Chief Constable. I mean, I think that's totally unfair. The, the responsibility of the police in this country going back for 10 years and the actions of the police in improving ourselves in relation to the way we deal with the community, particularly with the ethnic community, I think we have a record that we can be proud of. To actually take one incident, an incident, if you remember, however it started, and we're not sure why it started, but however it started ended up with severe damage, with people being put in danger, with massive violence on our streets. To actually lay that at the door of the police, I think, is non-productive. What we really need to be looking to see is how we can make things better. I, as one, and I'm sure all of my colleagues, will do everything in our powers to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Now, Steve, how do, you, how do you apportion blame as between the police and the, uh, and the community? When it comes to apportioning blame, Peter, I mean, the fact is that our community relations have improved. This country has some of the best race relations in any country in Europe. And in the last 10, 15 years, the police have made a concerted effort to try and understand through liaison committees and police liaison officers. Yeah, but how patchy is that as between one community well, and another? Well, it, it might be patchy. It might be patchy. I mean, it might be better off in West London, where I, I have my constituents, than maybe in, in uh, Bradford or Manchester. I don't know. But the fact is that there, there is a concerted attempt on the part of the police force to do something. Now, uh, 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 this particular incident, to sort of apportion the entire blame on the police force is quite wrong. It is, maybe there were two police officers who overextended themselves, who did something that they should not have done. But that is no excuse then to start burning and rioting and looting. Okay, that was. I can't believe what you're just saying. That was just, you must be living in cuckoo land. No, I don't. It's just, it's just typical. Whenever a riot happens, people just like kind of home in on the violence but the real cause of, uh, of this violence was the police. And it has been the police. And it's, been, uh, and it's not one incident, as the, uh, as the police just talked about. There's incidents everywhere. Even in your constituency, mm -hmm. you, you can go to Asian youth and you can ask them how the police deal with them. And they will tell you how they deal with them. And maybe you should do that before but coming into... You're saying there is an excuse. You're saying there is an excuse for throwing Molotov cocktails at the police? I think, it, to be brutally honest, though, I'm not, I am, I'm, you know, I'm not going to walk this right, really safe line to be acceptable. If somebody is going to intimidate my mother, then I have every right to protest and I have every right to do whatever is in my power. Because, and especially if it's the police, and you, you've got a right, a right to riot. You do not especially, have... Especially if the police who represent the law and represent all this like you know uh, justice and things like that who are taking the law into their own hands i hope it's a lesson for the police in bradford i hope it's a lesson for the police throughout england that they've got to wake up and they've got to stop reading these analysis of the asian community from the 19 50s or 60s no, said that they were really passive okay, i hope you're not, not saying on this program live to all the people who are listening to this and watching this that it is all right to break the law. It is not. Whether you're an Asian or not, it doesn't matter. It's all the right to break the law if the law doesn't protect you. Not at all. Absolutely. What, we have to be very careful as if I attacked your mother, people. If I attacked your mother, what would you do? I would call the police. Yeah, and if they didn't do it. But anything. that is not the point at hand. The and point the police... at hand, the point at hand is that two policemen may have extended themselves. But Come in, Chief not... Constable. Come in. That I'm does not give the right. Just to... I'm... Let's go to the Chief Constable. I'm just very interested when I've been criticised for talking about uh, differences between different uh, ages within the Asian community. I think we're seeing an example of, of that sort of difficulty that we have to deal with and we have to police. Let me take you back, though, Chief Constable, to one of the things Christian Gurumurthy reported in, in his report. He talked to a newspaper editor who said that there wasn't a single Asian who hasn't him or herself been or knows someone who's been harassed by police. I think obviously we can't deal with or refute that sort of allegation because we don't know what it is. What I can say is that the, there's been huge amounts of work in this part of Bradford and in this part of West Yorkshire, and that's what so saddens me. Can I say that the number of complaints against the police within that community is one of the lowest in West Yorkshire? The number of 
incidents, uh, letters of appreciation from the community, that particular community, is one of the highest in West Yorkshire. And for me, it's just a tragedy that this sort of activity and these sort of incidents occur. And I, on, word. I, I honestly. Pretty, pretty just a brief uh, final word, Kerry. Let's just go to Aki Nawaz and 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 the and, and Ajdeeba again. Just well, to... my final word is that the police and the, the the government in this country, and especially our so-called elected leaders in um, in Parliament, better wake up, because there's going to be there's trouble brewing, and if the police don't wake up to a change yeah. in the in in the approach to these, you know, being pushed around by the police, then there's going to be more trouble. Mr. Diva. What I would like to say on this program is that there may have been an unfortunate incident, but I want to, the, the wider message is this, that the Asian community is a very respectable community. That we do believe in law and order, we do believe in family values, we do believe in our culture. Thank you very, very much. I, thank you very, very much, and thank you, Chief Counsel. We must end there. I'm sorry, but we must, we must, we must move on. Well, now, in a moment, the voters of North Down give us a preview of the verdict they'll give this week on political developments in the wake of Northern Ireland's paramilitary ceasefires. But first, the rest of the day's news. Swan Hunter's shipyard on Tyneside has earned a last-minute reprieve days before its equipment was due to be auctioned off. It's been bought by the Dutch company THC. Two years ago, the yard went into receivership, yeah. and now it'll be used to build floating production vessels for the oil industry. Britain's second biggest dairy, Unigate, is cutting 1,500 jobs over the next three years. The company blames the cuts on the decline in door-to-door -door deliveries and the increase in the price of milk since the privatisation of the milk marketing board. The two men who won £22.5 million on this week's national lottery have said they're overcome and scared by their win. Speaking at a press conference, Paul Madison and Mark Gardner said that they'd be returning to work later this week. And we've just heard that the head of Serbia's state security Jovica Stanisic is in Pale tonight meeting Dr. Radovan Karadzic, the Bosnian Serb leader. And this meeting has fueled speculation that a further release of UN hostages may take place tomorrow. On Thursday, voters go to the polls in the Northern Ireland constituency of North Down at a by election after the death of the Unionist MP Sir James Kilfeder. The contest is being seen as a test of Unionist opinion on their own leaders and on government policy in the wake of the paramilitary ceasefires in the province. There's a perception in unionist circles that the government's being soft on Republican terrorists. And tonight's statement in the Commons by the Northern Ireland Secretary Sir Patrick Mayhew that the anti-terrorist legislation might be relaxed at some stage in the future will merely add to their concerns. Miriam O'Callaghan has been to North Down to gauge the mood there. Tully Carnot, a loyalist working class estate in North Down. Despite 10 months of peace here, the familiar images of violence and defiance, although fading, remain intact. North Down is overwhelmingly Protestant, but these grim surroundings are not typical of the area. Known as the Gold Coast, this is the Beverly Hills of Northern Ireland. One of the local towns is even called Hollywood. The homes, vast and opulent, house the wealthiest and most successful. This is Northern Ireland's most exclusive constituency, and apart from a few bombs in one of the town centres, they've been largely untouched by violence. The people here are predominantly unionists. They care about the union, and for the past 25 years, they returned the independent unionist, Sir James Kilfeder, as their local MP. His death earlier this year has led to this election. At the harvest fair, she'll be surely there and I dress in my Sunday clothes. But my shoes shone bright and my hot cock ride for a smile from a nut brown rose. No pipe of smoke, no horse I'll yoke, never my plow is rust colored brown. Till the smile and bride by my own fire side, just the star of the county down. From Black Tree Bay of the Dairy Chain, I'm a go with the Dublin town. No more bait I sing like a brown colleen. Send you off to Tully Corner, the area three. Here in Bangor, in the heart of this overwhelmingly unionist constituency, Thursday's by-election is being heralded as a critical barometer of current unionist thinking. 
It is in effect a mini referendum on what people here think of their unionist leaders and the political direction they've recently taken. Throughout Northern Ireland there's a profound mood of change and many unionists feel uncertain and apprehensive about the future. If this community here in North Down does vote for a new type of unionist politician, then it will be because they believe that unionism needs clearer and stronger leadership. Saturday morning in Bangor in the local Orange Lodge holds a garden fete to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the formation of the Orange Order. It's cold, not many people have turned out, and the only excitement is when Alan McFarland, the Ulster Unionist candidate in this election, turns up to open the event. In the army for 18 years and currently working for the party leader James Molyneux at Westminster, his biggest problem is that he has little or no profile and is largely unknown to voters. He's anxious today to stress his Northern Irish credentials. Some of you will know that my grandfather, to whom I was very close, was a prominent Tyrone Orangeman. <laughs> Ken McGuinness, one of the party's MPs, is running the campaign. He utterly rejects suggestions that their candidate is unknown and says over the three-week campaign, Alan McFarland has built up a solid reputation. Alan McFarland will be a good, practical politician. He'll try to give the sort of service in North Down that Sir James Kilfeder gave, a personal service while playing his part as a member of the Ulster Unionist team. Got to keep fit. You've got to cover the ground, chap. This is the man Alan McFarland will have to beat. Out and about canvassing in Dundonald, Robert McCartney, an independent unionist, standing as the United Kingdom candidate with the support of Ian Paisley's party, the DUP, is the bookie's choice to win the seat. Born in poverty on the Shankill Road, he's now one of Northern Ireland's most successful barristers. Formerly a member of the Ulster Unionist Party, he represented them in the early 80s on the Northern Ireland Assembly and has contested and lost this seat in North Down twice before. I'm not a voting personally at all. So, uh, I know. Why? I just, uh, it's just my own belief for it, like, but I won't be voting for them. It's just the, the only time you see them is when they want something done, as a vote personally. It's this level of unionist disillusionment with their current leaders that Robert McCartney is relying on to win. Now split from the UUP, he's campaigning passionately against the direction they've taken unionism and has rather grandly titled his campaign, Turn the Tide. That was the subject of a report. At a press conference the following morning in Bangor, the United Kingdom candidate rejected any suggestion that he was against compromise or that he was intent on moving unionism backwards. That is the total antithesis of what I am trying to do. And I do not believe the people of Northern Ireland or the people in North Down will subscribe to your analysis. And we will just have to wait and see until next Friday, early hours of the morning. The RUC Brass Band, the star attraction at this year's Royal Ulster Yacht Club Regatta. It's a big day out in North Down's annual social calendar. Down at the nearby marina, the Brava, owned by a syndicate of local businessmen, comes into dock. We've randomly selected them as a group to try and gauge reaction in the area to the two main unionist candidates. Up at the club later on, I begin by asking skipper Paul Fallon if he believes Robert McCartney is the likely winner. I think McCartney's probably the most popular one, but uh, he definitely wouldn't be my choice. Why? Uh, he's too much of the old brigade. Um, he, he's not coming with new ideas. He's still back in the back in history. But my personal choice would be McFarland, um, because I think. There's not too many runners anyway. This he's looks the most promising for me. People are looking towards the future in terms of peace, and uh, don't want to go back to the old ways and the old divisions. They want to look at cooperation, and they want to look at support between the communities. Who might you give your support to? I've no strong beliefs anyway. Um, 
I think there's been so much in the past about voting for uh, certain parties just because of what they hold. I don't see any real vote for me coming from any direction. So will you vote at all? No. Do you think at the moment in your community there's a crisis in unionism? Are people worried? I think probably they are worried about the future. I think the framework, framework document that they talk about, whilst it's not set in stone, I think the people believe that they're being forced into a situation that they don't necessarily want to be in. And I think that's that's the crux behind it, albeit that they realise that dialogue has to take place. They have got ability to talk about the situation, whether they want to talk to Sinn Féin, for example, or whoever else. They realise that they have to do that to go forward. The Conservative candidate in this election is Stuart Sexton. Although he supports the government in its moves towards peace, he's campaigning against the framework document, the blueprint drawn up between London and Dublin on the future of Northern Ireland. Since 1989, the Tories have fielded candidates in Northern Ireland, and in the last general election, the Conservative in North Down did remarkably well, coming second to Sir James Kilfeder. The message that we're putting up all around the town about they will listen to sex and sex are getting through. I, I'm remarkably good. And if you say we need a real Conservative in Westminster from Northern Ireland, they understand that That's because right. too long the province has been held at arm's length, hasn't it? Today, Theresa Gorman has come to Bangor to give her support. But Stuart Sexton's campaign isn't helped by the fact that the local Tory association is split, nor does he really have the support of central office, though Theresa Gorman was at pains to dispute this. You're quite wrong. They have been over here and they are supportive because Mr Sexton is very supportive of the peace initiative. And that's exactly right. But he doesn't support the framework document. No, but he does say that the party is on the right lines in negotiating for peace with the dissidents here, and he is saying that peace will come when there has been an agreement on surrender of weapons. But that is something which many people in Westminster also believe. Hello, how are you? In Hollywood High Street, the Alliance candidate Sir Oliver Napier, a former leader of the party for 12 years and a familiar face on Northern Ireland's political landscape, is out and about. He offers a moderate ticket, focusing on reconciliation and accommodation. The current leader, John Alderdice, arrives to give moral support. They're cheered by recent unofficial polls, which put them in second place. Oliver, the man of the moment. They stop to chat with local estate agent Eric Kearns. You know? So it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I think it's actually, days may tell too. my own personal view is that at, at, at the moment, the two, uh, if you like, better known candidates would be yourself and Bob McCarthy. And I think the others have got a bit of catching up to do. Uh, even to get into the last MP held the seat here for so long that John Alderdice believes the result is impossible to predict. Hello. Good morning, ma'am. All of Jim Kilfeder's votes are floating. It's a very volatile election. People are making their decisions even in the last uh, day or two. Uh, and it's clear that many of them are saying, what did Kilfeder stand for? Power sharing, devolution, working together, integrated education, the sort of things Napier stands for, not the sort of things McCartney stands for. This election is being viewed essentially, though, as a fight for the soul of unionism, and both McFarland and McCartney, as the two main unionist candidates, believe they offer the right way forward. The fundamental difference, though, is that McFarland is there representing the Ulster Unionists, the older established brand of unionism, and McCartney sees himself as offering new direction, new leadership. And all the best people in North Down. In September 1912, Sir Edward Carson, the most revered unionist leader ever, led a million Protestants to Belfast City Hall, where they queued to sign Ulster's Solemn League and Covenant, demanding that they remain part of the Union. There was a real fear at that time that they were about to be dragged into a united Ireland. It was a time of crisis, and Protestants believed that it was only Sir Edward's strong leadership that saved them. This is the table still in City Hall, but now rather battered by time, on which the Covenant was signed. It's a fitting memorial, in a sense, to unionism, which as a tradition feels that time has not been kind to it. If Robert McCartney does win the North Down seat, it will unquestionably be because unionists feel they need new leadership and a new direction.
Historian Paul Bew believes the importance of this election should not be underestimated. It's really very important. I mean, one way you can judge that is that uh, it is virtually certain that whoever is returned for North Down will not be as reliable a supporter for the major government as Sir Jim Kilfeder was. Now, nobody, that's a significant fact in itself, and yet p people aren't even commenting on that. They're commenting on other important aspects of, of the implications of this result, and in particular, the very profound implications for the leadership of the official Unionist Party because it has become, perhaps a little unfairly, something of a referendum on Mr. Molyneux's leadership this by-election. Back in the Yacht Club in Bangor, the crew from the Brava are still enjoying themselves. They recognise that at this time in history, their community needs strong representation. But the dilemma is, will whoever is elected as the honourable member for North Down in the early hours of Friday morning achieve this without threatening the peace and real attempts at reconciliation of the past 10 months? Mary Mo Callaghan and there are four other candidates standing in North Down. They are James Anderson, Natural Law Party, Michael Brooks, Free Private League Clegg candidate, Chris Carter, Ulster's Independent Voice, and Alan Chambers, the Independent Unionist. And the uh, newspapers tomorrow morning are full of pictures of Margaret Thatcher, of course. Uh, Major meets Eurosceptics after Mrs. Uh, Lady Thatcher's attack, says The Times. He's meeting them tomorrow. Major's ace's mortgage tax reprieve. The Telegraph has a story that Mr. Major may go back on mortgage tax relief in the autumn. And The Guardian has an interesting story here, suggesting that Labour's about to accept grant maintained schools like the National Union of Teachers. And that's all for Newsnight tonight. Good night. <laughs>